During Carmelo's playing time, he never was much of a vocal leader, but he did say something that stuck with me, and it was that nobody should expect more than you expect of yourself. Anthony for three, puts it in, next by one! Carmelo Anthony was born on May 29, 1984 in Brooklyn, New York, but later he moved to Baltimore, and that's where Melo spent his childhood and actually the place he grew up in instead of Brooklyn. The place in particular that Carmelo grew up in was called the pharmacy, a drug infested area that for most kids would be a horrible influence. Not for Melo though. His mother made sure he stayed out of trouble and kept himself focused on the task at hand, which in this case was his schoolwork. While most NBA stars that are touted at such a young age have a heavy background in basketball, like Kobe Bryant, whose dad was an NBA player and spent time overseas, or Andrew Wiggins, whose father was also an NBA player, and as a matter of fact, just like Andrew, was a first round pick. Carmelo actually didn't start taking basketball seriously until high school. Even then, Carmelo didn't really take it too seriously until one day, he was cut during his freshman season. After that, Carmelo was never the same and started evolving into one of the best scorers the league has ever seen. Once he was cut from his high school basketball team his freshman year, Melo made sure that he became the best player he could be. But not only that, he hit a ridiculous 5-inch growth spurt. We've seen this happen before numerous times. Sometimes it's while a player is in the NBA like Paul George going from 6'8 his rookie year to 6'10 the very next. Or like Anthony Davis, just like Carmelo, hit his growth spurt in high school. In my opinion, from what I've seen with other players hitting growth spurts while they're developing, they keep the skills they had as a shorter player and really are able to take advantage of being taller and already having some of those guard skills. So with Carmelo, I think that exact thing applies. Going from 6'1 to 6'6, and later to 6'8. In high school, Carmelo averaged 21.7 points and was ranked the third player in the country. During his high school career, Melo really stood out as a scorer and was touted the best off the dribble scorer of the class. He was only ranked third in the country and that doesn't seem supremely impressive because you'd maybe figure the best scorer in the class would be the best player, but he was going up against players like LeBron James and Dwayne Wade who are legitimate Hall of Famers. And unlike LeBron and Kobe before them, Melo ultimately made the decision to forego the NBA draft and join the Syracuse Orange. A lot of top players come into college and either struggle to adapt to the playstyle and in some cases just don't ever succeed in college and butcher any hopes of an NBA career early. But not Carmelo, he quickly adapted to the college game, coming in as a 21.7 point per game scorer, he was expected to bring some of that into the college game, where there is better team defense and coaching. But not only did Carmelo bring some of that scoring, but upped it to a solid 22.2 and it was not only Syracuse's best scorer but easily their best player. After he led his team to the NCAA tournament, Carmelo dazzled everybody, averaging 20 points throughout and making it all the way to the championship game. Being the underdogs that day, Melo gave his team 20 points along with 10 rebounds, upsetting top-seeded Kansas and bringing the Orange to their first ever national championship. With the third pick in the 2003 NBA Draft, the Denver Nuggets select Carmelo Anthony from Syracuse University. I've covered the 2003 NBA draft before, and to me, that's the best draft ever. When you have, to me, the greatest player of all time in it, it's easy to get overlooked, and when your accolades get compared to your peers, they won't be the best. But to me, if Carmelo was a part of any other draft class, such as the year after, he would have definitely been the number one pick over Dwight Howard. In Melo's first game, he only scored 12 points on 4 for 5 shooting from the field. Although it seemed like it would take a while for him to get used to the NBA playstyle and competition, in just his seventh game, he dropped 30 points, becoming the second youngest to ever do so in the league, second to only Kobe Bryant. Even though he scored a chunk of points, he shot 10 for 24, starting the trend of Carmelo being a volume shooter that can stuff the stat sheet every night. Starting his career with the Nuggets, Carmelo averaged 21 points per game and was second only to LeBron James in Rookie of the Year voting. Throughout his rookie season, Melo would continue to rack up the points and accomplishments. On the 30th of March, he would set the Nuggets record for the most points scored ever by a rookie. On top of that, he dropped 40 points at 19 years and 305 days old, becoming the youngest to ever do so so in the NBA. Like I stated before, being in this draft class was really a blessing and a curse. Because yes, Carmelo will always be a part of the best class ever, but when it came to his rookie season, he would be second to LeBron for the Rookie of the Year award, when mostly any other season, he would have been the winner. When we look at Carmelo's run in Denver, on the surface, it's a little underwhelming. 
not because of his performances or stats, but because he was putting up great numbers but could never win a championship or even make it to the finals. In the eight seasons he played for Denver, Carmelo averaged nearly 25 points, six rebounds, and three assists. And during this time, Carmelo to me could have been in the conversation for the best one-on-one -on -one score in the league. Yes, you had your legends like Kobe who were putting up crazy scoring numbers, but when you looked at Carmelo, his offensive repertoire was unmatched. Not only could he shoot from anywhere on the court, but wasn't a slimmer 6'6 guard like Kobe who had to force some shots up and nonetheless make them, but he was a solid 6'8 forward at nearly 240 pounds who had the handles of a guard and an attack from the triple threat that I've never seen before. With all of that said, a question starts to form. Why didn't any of this translate into a finals appearance? And to me, I think that answer has some layers to it. The teams in Denver that Melo was a part of were some of the most offensive oriented teams and up and down teams of their era. They consistently led the league in pace while being in the elevated area of Denver, but at the same time stayed top 10 in points scored per game. All of this would be amazing if offense was the only side of the ball being played, but as we all know that isn't the case. And Denver was always about middle of the pack in defense which most of the time will not result in a championship. I think that some of that blame could be on Carmelo as well though, because maybe the coaches should have held him accountable and maybe they tried, but as the leader of that team, I don't think that he set a great standard for what type of play the Nuggets needed to win a championship. When you're not playing all out defense, mostly every possession, you're not setting a great standard for the team and what they should be doing. After a tumultuous time of asking for a trade from the Nuggets, on February 21st, 2011, Carmelo Anthony's wish was granted. He was traded to the Knicks for Wilson Chandler, Raymond Felton, Nilo Gallinari, Timothy Mozgov, two second round picks, one first round pick, and $3 million cash. I'm surprised they didn't try to give up MSG Stadium and just have Melo, Stoudemire, and the crew play the rest of the season at Rucker Park. Nonetheless, for this haul, the Nuggets gave up an unhappy Carmelo along with an equally unhappy Chauncey Billups. Now we start the run of Carmelo back in his birthplace of New York, playing with, at the time, a five-time All-Star in Amari Stoudemire. This was a blockbuster move that in retrospect was also underwhelming. While Carmelo was in New York, he averaged 24 points, 7 rebounds, and 3 assists per game, winning a scoring title in the 2012 2013 season averaging 28 points and becoming a more polished ball handler and shooter. Carmelo wasn't the springy 20 year old he once was in Denver but his shooting ability overall and overall scoring was an all-time high. He could make any shot at any time and was always one of the most if not the most clutch player in the NBA. The problem was that the Knicks as a team were not that good and that's not saying that some of the players they had weren't good players but from the top down that organization seemingly did not know how to build a winning team. After trading away pretty much any future they had for Melo, they were left with a pretty boneless team, and that star that was supposed to be by Carmelo's side to help him bring a championship back to New York could not stay on the court. Amari Stratemeyer, ultimately in the five years as a New York Knick, only played 205 total games. And in three playoff series, New York managed to only have Stratemeyer in all of two of them. After trading away valuable role players and having to pay their stars big money, the Knicks were never able to surround Carmelo with any type of help, even if it meant getting a collection of second or third tier players, because their pockets just didn't allow it. While LeBron was able to team up with D-Wade and Chris Bosh, we seen what that was able to produce for the Heat. We never got to see what the duo of Amari Stratemeyer and Carmelo Anthony could really do at their full potential. Unfortunately, this meant all of the stats and accomplishments for Carmelo essentially meant nothing in the public eye because all they see is that number seven walking down the tunnel after losing a playoff series or not even making it. What could you change if you could from that time? What would you change? <sighs> from the Knicks? Mm -hmm. I, I think just the way that was handled. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like the how way you that, was handled. You know what I'm saying? How I was handled right. personally. Right. I, I, would, I would change that. After his departure from New York, Carmelo spent some time with the Thunder, which gave us some cool moments, Rockets, Trailblazers, and most recently the Lakers, where he showed that he's far removed from the elite scorer he once was, but he's still mellow. And no matter what, during that 2021-22 season, he was ready to shoot and occasionally could give us some throwback moments. I don't know what the future holds for Carmelo. There's been rumors of Chris Paul wanting him in Phoenix to give their bench some depth after giving up a chunk of it for KD, but I don't really know at this point. In some people's eyes, they have it set that if you don't win a championship, that takes away from your legacy or makes you less of a player. What people fail to look at and realize is that basketball is a team game, just like football, baseball, hockey, or even soccer. Winning a championship isn't as simple as, oh, this guy's good. He should win it all. Look at the World Cup this year. Lionel Messi has been the best player in the world for years. 
and finally won himself a World Cup. Does that mean that he wasn't great before he won? No. And I'm not saying Carmelo is on that same level, but he is solidified as a legend in this game and a first ballot Hall of Famer, who in my opinion is overhated. And year after year showed us that sometimes you can play good defense, but when it's somebody like Carmelo that you're guarding, better offense is just better. Thank you everybody who tuned into this video. I really wanted to make sure I went in depth about Melo because he's really one of my favorite players of all time. Comment down below if you think Carmelo is overrated or overhated. And also let me know who's your favorite NBA player, no matter their accomplishments. Give the video a like if you enjoyed it, subscribe, and don't smoke your lips.